Hi friends, it's Dana here. Today we're reading a story all about a man named Carl. He is a Swedish man and he is responsible for something really important that you probably don't even realize. When you pick up a plant um, at the, you know, at your hardware store or a garden center or a little packet of seeds, there's always that common name under there, like what you call it. But there's also that funny looking name that's in Latin. And this guy here, Carl, is uh, responsible for coming up with the system and a lot of those names actually and so today you're gonna hear all about how he came up with that system it's like it's having the Dewey Decimal system of plants it's it's so important to be able to have a classification system for all the things that are around us and Carl did it it's called Carl get out of the garden it's by Anna Sh Sanchez and illustrated by Catherine Stock let's do this Hey. Carl Linné was in the garden again. He just couldn't stay out of it. Carl, get out of the garden, Carl's mother ordered him to stay inside and study. He dreamed that someday he'd become a fine scholar, lawyer, or best of all, minister of the big church in their parish of Strunbolt in Sweden. But Carl was bored by schoolwork. He was always sneaking out to the garden. Even when Carl was a baby, he loved plants. He was born in the spring of 1707, and when he cried, his parents gave him flowers to calm him. As soon as he learned to walk, Carl toddled outdoors to his father's garden. As he got older, he pestered his father to tell him the name of every single plant. And the bugs. Carl watched them for hours. Striped ones, fuzzy ones, bugs with huge eyes and lots of legs. What were their names? Carl, get out of the garden, his mother begged him to get back to his school books, but Carl was too busy watching caterpillars crawl. Carl loved the garden, but he hated spending long hours indoors studying Greek and Latin. Annoyed teachers told Carl's parents their son wasn't smart enough to become a minister. Carl's disappointed father considered apprenticing him to a shoemaker. But one teacher appreciated Carl's love of plants and suggested that the boy become a doctor. In those days, plants were medicine, so Carl could spend lots of time in the garden. Carl pleaded to go to medical school instead of making shoes. Finally, his parents reluctantly agreed. What you enjoy doing, you will do well, his father told him. Carl's parents couldn't afford to give him much money for his studies. He was always hungry, happy to get even one meal a day. He had to patch his worn out shoes with tree bark or go barefoot, but he studied hard and soon began using his beloved plants to cure people's ailments. There was just one problem. Which plant was which? Doctors, gardeners, farmers, everybody argued about the names of plants. Dandelions might be called blowball, swine snout, or yellow daisy, depending on which town you lived in. Some plants had 30 or 40 different names. Doctors used long, complicated Greek or Latin names for plants, but they even, could, even they couldn't agree. Carl used a pretty pink rose to treat dog bites, but what was the right rose? One doctor called it Rosa Sylvestris Indora Sucanina. Another called it Rosa Sylvestris Alba Cum Robre, Folio Glabro. <laughs> Chaos, Carl cried. Barbarian jargon. People were confused about animals too. Was a bat a type of bird? Was a whale the same as a fish? Scientists argued bitterly. Carl decided to get things organized. He planned to bring the order to the chaos and give everything, everything a clear and simple name. But there were millions of organisms, elephants, mosses, cabbages, butterflies, zebras, cobras, daffodils, it was an enormous job. Could he do it? Hmm. <clears throat> Carl Linné was only a youngster fresh out of school, but he wasn't afraid of challenge. He rolled up his sleeves and got to work. First, he divided the, thing, the living world into two kingdoms, the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. Then he broke each kingdom into groups that he called classes. He divided plants into 24 classes based on the structure of their flowers. He gave each plant a name in Latin. 
every name had only two parts, short, easy to remember. The rose that healed dog bites became Rosa Canina, dog rose. Carl named plant after plant, but he never ran out of ideas for names. He named plants based on how they smelled or if they were fuzzy or prickly or smooth. Often he named plants after people he liked. He called a beautiful golden flower, Rudbeckia herta, after a favorite teacher, Olaf Rudbeck. Carl named the plants in his garden. He named plants in the woods and fields. He traveled thousands of miles into Lapland, far in the north of Sweden, to find more plants. Lapland was chilly, roadless wilderness. Sometimes Carl waded up to his armpits in icy water. Swarms of midges filled my mouth, nose, and eyes, he wrote. Often he had nothing to eat but fish and reindeer's milk. Carl braved the cold to collect plants. Crawling on hands and knees, he searched for tiny mosses. Climbing high into the trees, he gathered pine cones. He discovered plants no scientist had ever seen before. Carl's favorite was a pink wildflower with twin blossoms and a shiny evergreen leaves. The smell of the flowers was as sweet as candy. Later, in the little, later the little plant was named after him, Linnea borealis, or Linnea of the North. Okay. Carl wasn't afraid to take on the animal kingdom. Ostriches, camels, jellyfish, ladybugs, toads, earthworms, sharks, all the living things that flew or swam or ran or crawled. Carl wanted to choose scientific names for them all. But animals came in so many different shapes and sizes. Could he do it? And where should he start? The first step in wisdom is to know the things themselves. Truth ought to be confirmed by observation, Carl said. So he went into his laboratory and looked at how animals were put together on the inside. Carl peered into the mouths of bats and saw that they have teeth, not beaks. He touched the skin of bats and learned they have fur, not feathers. Other scientists thought bats were birds, but Carl said no. Carl disagreed with scientists who claimed that whales were fish. He decided whales were mammals because they bear live young and breathe air with their lungs, not gills. Whales in the same group with mice? It seemed crazy, but Carl knew they were similar on the inside. Carl divided the animal kingdom into classes. Class Quadrupedia, mammals. Class Aves, birds. Class Pisces, fish. Class Amphibia, amphibians and reptiles. Class Insecta, insects, class Vermes, worm, and other miscellaneous invertebrates. Then he added another group. Class Paradoxa was for animals that were rumored to exist, like unicorns or dragons. Carl realized that they might not be real, but just in case they were, he made room for them. Just as he had done with plants, Carl gave each animal two names. He named honeybees Apis, bee, Mellifera, honeybearing. He named dogs Canis, dog, Familiaris, familiar. And Carl knew that people are animals too. He called humans Homo, human, sapiens, wise. Was Carl finished yet? Not yet. Ever since he was a toddler, Carl had loved insects, but he had a huge job when it came to organizing class insecta. Ants, moths, aphids, crickets, wasps, and beetles, beetles, beetles. Could he do it? Carl studied tens of thousands of insects to find out what made them alike and what made them different. He divided the insect class into groups called orders. He put all the insects with wings covered with bright colorful scales in the order Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths. Insects that had hard forewings, he put in the order of Coleoptera, beetles. He looked at ants, bees, and wasps, at their narrow waists and sharp stingers, and put them all together, order Hymenoptera. Carl split each order into families. He then split each family into smaller groups. Each group was called a genus, and each genus was made up of species. Carl eagerly wrote books about his new ideas, but when other scientists read them, they got angry. 
famous botanists and zoologists had spent their lives inventing names like, hold on, Hypophyllocardopendendorum and Monolasiocalinomenophyllorium. Mm, they were furious when this young upstart threw out their work. And almost everyone agreed that Carl had made an enormous blunder. He had named humans as if they were just another animal. <clears throat> animal. Even worse, he had lumped them with mammals like groundhogs and gorillas, cats and chimpanzees. A botanist named Johann Siegsbeck called Carl's work loathsome. The Pope banned Carl's books and ordered that they be burned. Carl lost his temper. Idiot and fool, he called Siegsbeck. The two men fought bitterly, trading insults by mail. But Carl had the last word. He named a fuzzy, bad-smelling weed Siegsbeckia orientalis. <laughs> Finally, Carl realized that arguing would do no good. Time is too valuable to be spent in disputes, he wrote. He just went on naming things. Carl became a teacher. Perhaps he remembered how bored he had been in the classroom because he used his garden as a living textbook filled with thousands of plants. He led exciting, rowdy field trips into the woods and meadows, expeditions with hundreds of students lasting from morning till night. Carl and his students marched along, carrying banners and playing musical instruments. Whenever someone found an unusual plant, Carl would hurry over and get down on his hands and knees to examine it. If the plant was a rare specimen, he would call for the bugles to sound. That's fun. As Carl's students grew up, Many of them traveled to far off places to study nature. Arabia, India, Russia, China, Australia, Africa, Japan, they voyaged around the globe and everywhere they went, they taught people about Carl's ideas. They wrote to their beloved teacher about all the new plants and creatures they saw. And Carl realized he wasn't even close to being done with his big job. His students sent him specimens from the tropical islands, Arctic mountaintops, deserts, on tables and shelves in his study were spread dozens, hundreds, thousands of specimens. Mulberries from Canada, silkworms from China, seashells from India, water lilies from Egypt. He had live animals too, a raccoon from North America and a parrot from South America. Could he name them all? Yes, Carl classified and named more than 12,000 species of plants and animals. Now scientists around the world, whether they spoke English or Swedish, Russian or Chinese, could communicate with one another using the same unique name for each living thing. Carl had done it. He had created a new language of science and changed the way people saw the world. Doctors, farmers, gardeners, everyone began to use Carl's clear and simple system. His fame spread. Awards and medals were showered on him. Kings and queens eagerly read his books. In 1757, Caroline was knighted by the King of Sweden. King Adolf Frederick dubbed him a Knight of the Order of the Polar Star, the first scientist to be given that great honor. And Carl gave himself a more important sounding Latin name, Carlus Linnaeus. He also designed a coat of arms as a symbol of his nobility. Most people picked fearsome beasts like lion or dragons to decorate their coats of arms. But Carl chose Linnea Borealis, the little sweet-smelling twin flower from Lapland. Even after he became a rich and famous man, Carl went on working in the garden. He planted thousands of species from all over the world. Banana trees, wild tulips, water lilies, cacao bushes, laurel trees and his beloved twin flowers. Plants for medicine, plants for food, plants for learning, plants for joy. Monkeys, parrots, and peacocks shared the garden too. Along, among his plants and animals, Carl said, I live happier than a king. Carl never did get out of the garden. That's the end there, friends. If you pick up this wonderful book, Carl, Get Out of the Garden, there's all sorts of fun facts in here that you can read all about Carl and his naming system. And for me, I know I learned a lot about the naming system in this book, and I learned a little bit about Sweden, which is super cool. <laughs> I hope you all had fun reading with me, friends. Have a great day and get out in the garden.